What's going on, champions? This is Julian Stout, licensed personal trainer, licensed PE teacher, world record powerlifter, and special education teacher here to take the fear out of fitness and help you be the best you. Guys, today's topic is simple. Is this simple? Is the food industry going to move away from alternative sweeteners now that we know the truth? So, a lot of the times you hear things get recalled, right? When you find out that a product is dangerous, right? But I have a sneaking suspicion that some of these products are not going to go away so easily. For instance, about a month ago, I informed you guys that Splenda, aka Sucralose, is genotoxic. It is toxic to your genes. It's toxic to your chromosomes. And I have to tell you, you all know that sucralose is in everything right now. I want to let you know something. I'm not going to be one of these people who are going to irresponsibly put out information that is outdated. There are people out here right now that are putting out information about trans fats and foods that are allowed in America but not allowed in other countries when the truth is that used to be true that's not as true anymore do you still have to be mindful about what it is that you put it in your body absolutely but things like trans fats and um, brominated vegetable oil has been removed from the majority of our products since in some cases 2015 some, t some cases 2017, 2018, even as recently as 2020. But that does not mean that you should keep your eye off the ball and stop paying attention to what they're putting in your food. Because clearly sucralose is poison and it has been recommended that you shouldn't even have even a little bit of it. But as you well know, it is in every food that is considered healthy now anything a lot of your protein shakes have it a lot of your protein bars have it a lot of your sodas have it a lot of your juices have it uh, when i say your, i should say your drinks not your juices juices are natural but a lot of your drinks have it it's in your candy it's in your gum it's in everything and now that we know it's genotoxic, what are we going to do about it? Are we going to start making demands that we need to move away from it and go back to more natural sources? Or are we going to just accept what is and try to dodge bullets? Guys, the reason why I'm telling you this is because there is implications that are going to happen when we make or if we make decisions to move away from artificial sweeteners. A lot, the powers that be doesn't necessarily want to empower foreign nations. Kind of like our foreign dependency on oil, some of them will feel like a foreign dependency on sugar, for instance, will create a geopolitical, how should I put it? A geopolitical imbalance to where, well, to them it would be an imbalance, to others it would be a balance, but a geopolitical imbalance to where it'll be no different than the United States relying on foreign oil, right? Well, well here's the difference. We could build, we can make our own sugar especially in the southern regions of the country, we can make our own sugar. We have territories in the United States that can also supply with the sugar if they so choose to. However, it is highly unavoidable with the amount of sugary confectionist items in our food that we are going to supply the entire world with sugar. So, Here's the deal. A lot of you don't know 
how do we get to high fructose corn syrup, aspartame, and the like, right? So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to show you this article that, I'm, that I've read. The secret history of why soda companies switch from sugar to high fructose corn syrup. So I'm gonna skip a little bit of this, but I'm gonna start with this, far, this first part. In a mesmerizing recent article, Mother Jones, Tim Murphy recounts the surprising backstory of one of the corporate marketing's greatest flops. Coca-Cola's quickly aborted 1985 effort to tweak its formula and convince consumers to accept new Coke. The piece ends with a twist I didn't see coming. Gay Mullins, the eccentric Aragon or Oregonian who launched a crusade to restore the old formula, wasn't satisfied when the beverage giant caved to his demand. Soon after the restoration of Coke Classic, Mullins held a press conference to complain that it tasted differently from the Coke he remembered because it was made with corn syrup. He declared he would not rest until Coke was once more made with real sugar. Mullins' pivot to high fructose agitation turned out to be as much as a bust as the new Coke he helped kill. Coca-Cola already started adding high fructose corn syrup to the mix five years before the new Coke fiasco. By 1984, a year before New Coke's debut, the switch was complete, sugar out, HFCS in. All right, I'm gonna skip a little bit of this. So, how did high fructose corn syrup take over sugar as the soda's industry sweetener of choice anyway? Nearly 30 years ago, Coca-Cola switched from sugar to high fructose corn syrup to sweeten America's beloved carbonated drink. With corn subsidized by the government, its sugary syrup became a more affordable option for the beverage company. So, corn subsidies be begat cheap corn, which in turn leads to a corn-derived sweetener cheaper than sugar. Voila! HFCS takes over the soda market. But while corn subsidies played a role in the story, another less famous government intervention played, likely played a bigger role. The tale, which I first laid out in Richard Manning's excellent 2005 book, Against the Grain, started in early 1971 when a massive surprise sale of U.S. grain to the Soviet Union triggered a boom in corn prices, which in turn led to a massive ramp up in corn planting. But by the mid-70s, corn prices had returned to earth. But buoyed by subsidies, farmers kept planting fence row to fence row. As then Department of Agriculture Chief Earl Butts put it, the result, massive overproduction of corn, the current corn glut of the heels of ethanol-driven boom of 2006 to 2012, followed a similar pattern. So basically... What they're saying is the creation of ethanol, which is made from corn, which is a corn alcohol, is actually part of the reason why we have high fructose corn syrup in our means today. So corn processing giants like Archer Daniels Midland had access to all the cheap corn they could ever want but could only make a profit if they could find new markets for the corn products. The company came up with two big ideas, ethanol, designed to disrupt the massive gasoline market, and high fructose corn syrup, which the company hoped would break up big sugar's hold on the soda industry. So, there's a thing called wet milling. I'm gonna skip some of this. But, here we go. It has something to do with Watergate. I'm not going to even get into that. ADM got into corn fructose production he very heavily around 1974, just as sugar prices peaked on world markets. After ADM invested heavily to increase its capacity to produce high fructose corn syrup ninefold, sugar prices plummeted from 65 cents to 8 cents a pound. The reason inexpensive, inexpensive foreign imports had driven down sugar price. As a result, ADM could not make high fructose corn syrup cheaply enough to compete. 
To overcome this obstacle, ADM succeeded not in the lab, but rather in the political arena. Like Midwestern Machiavelli, Andres came up with a in ingenious plan. Support lobbying efforts by Florida sugar cane growers to convince Congress to impose a quota on foreign produced sugar. In 1981, Andreas got his wish. Newly elected President Ronald Reagan, who's also responsible for aspartame, by the way, another close ally of ADM chief, signed a law placing high quotas on imported sugar, which quickly raised the domestic price of sugar to twice the price on the global markets. Suddenly, high fructose corn syrup was the cheaper sweetener and the quota ensured that the domestic sugar price would remain elevated. Both Coke and Pepsi quickly started using more high fructose corn syrup, says the reports. So I'm going to stop there. But there's more. The World Health Organization is now suggesting that People don't drink enough Coke to get as much aspartame as it would take to create a cancerous atmosphere. Even though we already know since 1960 something that aspartame causes cancer in lab rats. So it's saying that we would need to drink the average person, so a person that weighs as much as I do, would need to drink 9 to 14 cans of, say, Diet Pepsi or Diet Coke per day to exceed that level. Now, guys, as you well know, let's go to calculator.com, right? A can of soda is 12 ounces. If you know your math, 9 times 12 is 108 ounces. 14, however, which would be, I believe, 168 or just under that, 144, let's see, 168, a little bit more than that, 168, um, that'll be 180, 180 ounces of fluid, right, 14 times 12, actually it's 168, I was right, I had it wrong the first time, so anywhere between and a gallon, guys, is 128 ounces, right? 128 ounces is a gallon. So we're looking at a gallon and a third, right? So just under, just over a, a gallon and a quart. So let me ask you guys a question. How much soda do you drink on a daily basis? Let's be honest. Is it one can a day? Is it 120 ounce a day? Is it a one liter a day? Is it two liters a day? All right. As the great Warner Wolf once said, let's go to the videotape. So it says 1.9 sodas per day, but let's see. Forty-four gallons of soda per year. The average person drinks. All right. So let's do the math. Clear. Forty-four times one twenty-eight. Five thousand six hundred and thirty-two ounces a year and let's divide that by 365.25 
So the average person drinks at least one can a day. Just a little over a can. But we all know that that's the, stand, that's the median. There are people who consume more than 15 ounces a day. There's people who consume less than 15 ounces a day. I being one of the people who consumes less. My wife now consumes less. She used to be on the greater side. So here's the deal. If the World Health Organization is suggesting that cancer only hits when it's 108 to 168 ounces, do you really want to find out if that is actually accurate? Some people are more sensitive than others. Do you want to find out if you're the sensitive one or not? Or do, would you just like that to not be a thing? Because, yes, I understand as a diabetic, there are needs that need to be met. Because of the hard choices that people have to make on a day-to-day -day basis, it is important for us to be more informed about the things we put into our body. There are so many people out here who do not know how dangerous sucralose is. I talk to people that I that I come across in the gym on a regular basis, and I ask them that question. Do you know that sucralose is poison? And they go, no. Are you serious? And I'm like, very serious. Study just came out not too long ago. All right? And this information is now out now, and this information like aspartame being cancerous has been known since 1960 something all right they've known for decades but yet they tried and tried and pushed and pushed to get this stuff on the market ladies and gentlemen we have a situation and the situation is we need to make noise about this or else they're gonna keep sneaking this stuff in your food and you're gonna be none the wiser. And as a result, you're going to be on the bad end of a health crisis. Whether it be diabetes, um, a congestive heart failure, gastrointestinal, gastrointestinal reflux disease um you got any kind of serious health concerns anything cancer some sort of genetic disorder where your genes have unraveled so because it's unraveled now you are at risk for other serious um, defects of other parts of your body specifically like your liver which is the part that detoxes most of this stuff Guys, I did not know Splendor would be that bad. I honestly did not. I thought, yeah, it'll mess with your liver a little bit, do a little something, something, but it ain't as bad as sugar or it ain't as bad as aspartame and come to find out it's worse. I thought, it'd be at, I thought at worst, it'll be just as bad as aspartame. But now it's worse. So what are we going to do about it? It's in everything that we all consider healthy. Should we, in the fitness community, go back to sugar? Just modify and be mindful about what we are in, in entering into our bodies enough to know that, yes, our protein shake has sugar in it. However, because it has sugar in it, we have to monitor all the other foods that we eat to make sure that we're not putting ourselves in a diabetic situation meaning gaining excess body fat because of a overconsumption of sugar. I think we need to have a conversation about this. Please comment down below. Tell me what you think about this because I really want to know what you guys think about this. I really want to have an open and honest discussion about this situation, guys. So please, I would love for you 
to give me a comment or two and have an open dialogue with me on this subject matter. Also, if you can, please share this with your loved ones because if you guys don't share this stuff, your loved ones will not get this information and make conscious decisions as to what they're going to do with their health and their lives. So it would be great. It would be a great service to not only me, but to others as well to um, send out this information to other people, ju not just to fund my ability to keep granting you information. Also, like it so that way other people on YouTube can see this video as well. I really appreciate everybody here, all 156 of you. So please don't forget to like, subscribe, share, follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and on YouTube. Have a nice day and be the best you.